for eight. Yes. Here we go. Okay. Cynthia Allen, glad to be with you today for this free session uh, where we're going to explore the brilliance of oppositional movement. And I'm very pleased to have all of you here. I know there will be some few more people joining us in. Of course, we know what's coming up, right? We know that the summit is coming up. I am, by the way, the creator of the summits and uh, of the Your Learning Body and online Feldenkrais community. And uh, I'd like to start there. Uh, where are you from? Who's registered for the summit and why? Where are you from? Who's registered for the summit and why? Because there will be people here that aren't registered who is just really on the fence about that whole idea. And let's let's uh, get excitement about it because in 15 days, we're going to start the summit and we are going to have an incredible 10 days of uh, activity, incredible 10 days. Registered wants to address trauma in the body, in her body, thank, or their body. Yes, thank you so much, Vicki. Um, Cindy, she's been at every summit. I bet I know which Cindy that is. <laughs> Oh, always learn a lot. Wonderful. Sorka already registered, likes Feldenkrais and Alexander technique. Beautiful. Uh, we got people from all over Spain, Canada, Colorado. And Ramona says why she's because she's getting older. That's a great reason, isn't it? I mean, life keeps changing. So that makes Feldenkrais actually valuable at just about every st stage of the journey. Margaret from San Francisco, she has a tennis elbow issue, okay. Um, uh, Sharon, she's heard about Feldenkrais but never experienced it. She's ready, great, great. Uh, Annie, Annie, coming to relax as we move into the fall, the autumn. Yeah, absolutely, good. Um, Fiona, I just love Feldenkrais, it's life changing. Yes, thank you for asking for the transcripts. I forget to do that. It's kind of a new thing for me to try to grasp. So thank you for that. No, uh, no, no. Oh, Hester from Toronto registered, also even purchased the early package. Last summit was great. So she's returning and she's still using the videos all the time. That's what we want to hear that you not only find the summit, the free summit, really valuable. And let me say tens of thousands of you are going to come to only the free summit 15 days. And you're going to write us incredible notes of how much you've gotten out of it. A very small percentage of people will actually decide that they want to own the recordings. So you're welcome to own the recordings. You're welcome not to own the recordings, but we, we appreciate it when people own the recordings because we work on the event for a year with a team of people that we need to pay. So it makes it, it helps us. It helps us tremendously to make sure we can pay our folks. Oh, beautiful. Look at these just keep coming in. This is fantastic. Fantastic. Yes, yes, London. Pilates teacher, but love Feldenkrais. Well, great. We love Pilates. Um, and um, Kathy from Maryland, been doing it since 1998. Fiona from the UK, she's curious, beautiful. Uh, Heather from the UK, more recently, been looking to learn more about Feldenkrais recently. I love this. Erin, interested to change from Oregon, you and here in the US. Christine, more awareness of the body needed. Yes. Uh, Leslie, ah, oh, you attended the summit last year. And you even see me as your primary guide. Leslie, I'm touched. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, yeah, that's something that comes out of summits is people find a teachers that they want to continue with and they will choose a lot of different, different, there'll be a lot of different choices. Okay, let me try to fix the sound here again. Okay. Um, so um, the things that I want to say is be sure your cameras are not on if you are not okay with being seen by people, although we try to make sure that we only have people on cameras that are really ready for it. The truth is, is that things happen on Zoom, like if you cough and uh, you end up up here on the picture. And um, that 
can create a bit of a challenge for us because we want to be able to just keep streaming and make these things available early. We can't stop and edit them. And also be aware that what we're going to be doing today is uh, movement, gentle movement, but anybody can be hurt with just about anything at any time. Sometimes you just never know what's going to trigger something in someone. So you want to really follow any advice you've ever been given by your doctor or healthcare providers. And you want to stop at any point if anything feels at all uncomfortable, a little bit scary. You just think, I don't know. I don't think this is for me. Really examine that instead of just being carried along forward in um, sort of the enthusiasm of the movement. Now, we had this incredible movement challenge from Era Philly. It was called Era Philly's Movement Challenge. And do you remember what it was? It was, all right. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. So we're going to play with that in a little bit, but I want to announce the winner of that movement challenge is Sumi Chan. Uh, we know her as Sumiko in the Bones for Life world. Sumi Chan is Sumi here. Let's see. It's probably the wrong time. She is. Sumiko is here. Oh, wonderful. Sumiko, you won. You won. You raise your hand. I'll put your face up if you like. Uh, you want, she, what does she win? She ran won a free year to the Your Learning Body community. So she will actually be studying with me and other teachers at absolutely no charge over the next year and um, having a wonderful, wonderful experience. So it's so exciting uh, for us to see Sumi, Sumika win. And that also means that she was entered into the grand prize win uh, contest for the entire summit. So every time a person enters a game, their name goes into the grand prize drawing. So all the games together that are designed to help you learn and engage in the summit, there's a grand prize drawing at the end. And that grand prize drawing at the end is a free QOR360 chair. Katrina is going to put a link to that in case that makes you interested and you just want to go check it out, which is a phenomenal chair for uh, posture, balance, and and uh, keeping an enlivened um, body and spine while sitting. So um, the two things that I promised in today's session was a movement lesson that I think will make Air Philly's challenge for you easier. And then also to explain why this ability to move in opposition is important. Now you may discover for yourself why, why it's important by feeling for yourself after the lesson, what happens. So I don't wanna give it away in case you actually go after the lesson, man, I feel fantastic. I, I, gotta, I gotta have more of that. I want to be sure that you actually uh, are in fact uh, given the chance to discover it for yourself. Given the chance to discover it for yourself. And I'm going to switch. Yeah, good. I'm glad you're happy, Sonico. You were just, you were adorable doing it. Adorable, that smile at the end, having fun with it. Um, I'd like to get an idea of who here is new or experienced. So if you could start putting in the chat new, or if you uh, have a little experience, you could put that. If you have a lot of experience, just let's get a feel for uh, what we've got here in terms of people. So I'll make sure I across the span. Beautiful. Great. Okay. We have a lot of new people. Wonderful. Um, we have people with a lot of experience. Wonderful. And then we've got, I see that my, my, my colleague Beth is out there. Thank you, Beth. Um, yes. So good, good, great. Lots, lots of variations, even practitioners, lots of practitioners, but a lot of new people with some people with small. Okay. I think I got something for everybody. I know those of you who are practitioners who've been doing Feldenkrais for a long time will recognize some elements of this lesson. They're very classic Feldenkrais things, but I think I've done a couple things that are a new little spin for you. And so you just hang in there and I hope you'll find it very interesting. And then um, those of you who are new, uh, absolutely gonna take you along uh, through the lesson. Uh, I suggested that in a 
that you have a small stack of like folded bath towels. You like something that is not super um, short. Like if it's like, this is it. When your head rolls, it kind of rolls off the back. So I like to fold them so that there's a little bit of width, maybe about a foot or more of width to it. So that, or length to it, if you could think of that. So that as the head rolls, you don't feel like it's falling off the back of a cliff. You will be both lying on your back as well as on your side. And when you're on your side is when it'll be probably come the most important. We don't want your head hanging in any uncomfortable way. Now the positions that we're gonna be in are lying on your back, our side line, as I said before, with your knees bent. But there are some of you who are gonna say, I can't get to the floor. You can do this on a bed uh, and especially a firm bed, but you can definitely do this lesson on a bed. Absolutely can do this lesson on a bed. You can do this lesson pretty much in a recliner, as long as it's a recliner that goes all the way back. I mean, you'll have to make some adjustments. It won't be perfect uh, in terms of how the position is, but you'll get improvement, I believe. And I think you can even creatively make adaptations if you absolutely have to stay sitting like you're in a wheelchair. I won't be able to coach all those adaptations or the lesson will just take forever, but I think I can give you a couple hints here or there. And I, I believe you'll be able to be creative enough to do it. Of course, when you are able to lie down, this takes away a lot of work out of your nervous system. The muscles go, oh, I don't have to hold on anymore. Where when you're sitting, there is a continual amount of work that has to go on to keep you up in gravity. So this is why we want to do this lesson lying on the back or on the side if we can. Now, I need a few people who are very experienced in Feldenkrais who would be totally fine with being on the camera during this movement lesson so people can see you to raise your virtual hand. And I will be spotlighting a few of you at different times so that people can uh, get a reference. Please don't raise your hand uh, if you're having any concerns about being on camera. Beautiful, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bettina and Noah. Thank you. Is it Noah, Noe, Noe? I've never asked you how your name was spelled, said. I've only ever read it all these years. Uh, oh, good, wonderful, beautiful. That's great. Thanks so much. I think that'll be good. If you're having trouble with sound, please uh, check your own sound setting systems or log out and log back in. And that usually will take care of the situation. Okay, let's start in sitting. Let's do some pre-tests in sitting. So come to sit however you are. <clears throat> now, I will suggest that, especially when we get into the lesson, that you take your glasses off, but you can leave them on for the moment. And this was Arafili's movement challenge for us. So let's get a feel for where you're at here at the beginning of this lesson in that actual movement challenge. So I'm going to guide you through that movement challenge. So first... She asked you to move your eyes right and left. So I would like you to move your eyes right and left. And as you do that, feel for yourself, what's the quality of that movement like? What's the quality of that movement like? Are you comfortable with it? Do you feel like you have control over it, or does it feel like the eyes just fly one direction or the other? Do your eyes tend to stay on the horizon, or do they get lost and kind of go up or down, or you're not even sure what happens with them? Okay, let's pause with that. Pause with that. And then move your tongue left and right. Okay, your tongue. Uh-huh. And you feel what that's like for yourself. Beautiful. And you can feel if it feels like a like there's tension in the back of the tongue as you do it. Sometimes the back of the throat. 
Yeah, for now, the head should stay still. That's a great question, Cassandra. The head should stay still. Good. Now, pause with that and take an easy breath or just relax your eyes and make sure you're still just feeling good there sitting because we're going to have a little extra challenge, which is while your head stays still, your eyes will go one way and your tongue will go the other way. How is that for you? Okay, good. So you can feel that. Now, pause again. Just relax your face and take a moment, take a breath, something that feels calming to you. Release any tension that might have built up just from doing that movement, right? It's, it's interesting to feel how quickly the, the challenge rises. So can you turn your eyes one way and your tongue the other way? Mm -hmm. Great. Let that go again. Another easy breath. How about you take your jaw from side to side? Uh-huh, nice. Take a pause. Mm -hmm. And now this was the finale movement that most of us kind of went, are you kidding me? So you turn your jaw and eyes in one direction and your tongue in the opposite direction. Your jaw and eyes in one direction and your tongue in the opposite direction. I can't do it and talk at the same time. That's for sure too much for me. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, and that's great. We should, we should end up, I hope you end up smiling and laughing at yourself with the whole thing, right? <laughs> that it can be a funny, funny experience and not something that uh, stresses us out, out too much. Good. Now let that go again. Let's go again. And in sitting, just kind of tune into the quality of your sitting. How does it feel for you? Does it feel easy, uh, effortful? Like you have to work hard to keep that head up in the air or very, very simple? How are the muscles of your neck and your shoulders in this position? They feel like well-balanced or you feel like, oh, something hurts here. Something doesn't feel great. Or in your low back. And then how about the tissues of your face and your jaw? Do they feel a little tight, held up, compressed? Do they feel soft or vibrant or like they sort of hang in relationship to gravity? Like we would, most of us worry about our tissue hanging on our face, right? We would like to think of it as toned and beautiful, but maybe it doesn't have to always be held up. <clears throat> And then notice the resting position of your tongue. What do you, where do you like having your tongue when you're not doing anything specific with it, right? When it doesn't need to be working, where do you like having your tongue? The bottom of the mouth, in the middle, kind of floating around, some part of it on the roof of the mouth. Yeah, Judy, so you notice that. You notice that you're, you constantly find that tongue pressed up against the roof of the mouth. Yeah, that's good, beautiful. And then a last thing I'd like to invite you to notice is what is 
What does the space inside your mouth feel like? Is there any space in there? Do you notice that there's space there? Like maybe you notice space around the sides or the back of the mouth or across the top of the palate, the vault of it? How about in the back of the throat, the airway, the swallowing areas? What do you notice there? And then just simply turn to look towards one direction. You get to choose what direction. You look, turn to look to see something. And notice the speed at which you turn and if it's comfortable. Or did you run into some limitation, some tension that said, no, I don't really like this so much. And when you noticed that tension, did you keep going or did you stop? Did you listen to it? And then turn in that same direction just one more time and notice what do you see in the room? What do you see? So you know where you're sitting and you know what you see because you're gonna to return to this at the end. And then go ahead and turn, when you're ready, turn to the other direction, the one you didn't choose first. And how is that? What's your comfort level? What's your range? What do you see? Good. Now go ahead and make your way when you're ready to your back, <clears throat> lying on your back. It's gonna, we're gonna be together about an hour and then uh, I will be available to stay around for questions and comments. But for those of you who are there wanting just the movement section, we'll be together until about 11 and then we'll go from there. <clears throat> now, please come to your back and for, take a moment to sense for yourself whether you need a little padding underneath your head Okay. And <clears throat> well, how do you know if you need a little padding under your head? You know by playing around with it, actually. You put a little padding in and you go, hmm, how's that feel? You take out half that amount and you go, hmm, how's that feel? And then you put a little more in and you go, hmm, how's that feel? And you go without any and you go, how does that feel? So you need these contrasts in the nervous system instead of just settling right from the beginning. And sometimes in a Feldenkrais training in the beginning classes, we might spend 10, 15 minutes on helping people begin to realize when they're comfortable and not comfortable with padding under their head. It's not a simple thing. People think they know, but in fact, we know what's familiar we often don't know what's comfortable. I'm gonna say that again. We know what's familiar. We often don't know what is actually comfortable. So it's very valuable to take time to play with that idea because if your head is uncomfortably hanging back or so far up that it feels like it compresses your throat, but you don't even notice it because that's what you've always done. It will make a difference in the rest of the lesson. So you play around as you like, because you're in charge. And it's all about you getting to know yourself better. It's not about you doing exactly what I tell you to do. Okay, so as you're lying on your back, please, just take a moment to start to feel the quality of how you're resting there. And the choices that you're making around how you've placed your legs, around how your feet are, maybe your legs are long, maybe you've placed your feet in a standing position so that they're flat on the ground and the knees are bent towards the ceiling. Maybe you've done something different. And you've also placed your arms in a very specific way. That's unique to you and your organization today.
And you might notice some details of, that are different right and left. Perhaps your right shoulder blade, for example, lies on the floor in some way that's slightly different than your left shoulder blade. Maybe you feel one shoulder blade is bigger, heavier, more curved, flatter, pointier. And then you might notice the space behind your low back. This is an area that a lot of people tune into. And that might not be the same from right to left. And then the weight on the back of your pelvis. Another area that many people are quite interested in. And you may feel like you lean much more heavily on one side. There's more pressure. Or you might feel you lean more towards the bottom of the pelvis or the middle or the top of it. And then take a moment just to feel again in this lying position, the muscles of your face, the tissues of your face, the skin. And the quality there, the quality of those tissues and the space inside your mouth. The space in which the air moves, how it comes in and how it goes out. Notice if you just begin to think about the tissues having weight, just a little bit of weight to them. You know, they're hydrated. They have a little moisture in them. They have a little, little actual heft to them. What happens if we begin to think about the tissues being able to just relax into gravity? That maybe they fall back towards the floor, towards the ground, just a little around the cheek, around the lips, the corners of the eyes, the ears. Mm -hmm. And then let that go and please do bring your feet to be flat on the ground with the knees bent. Take your time to do that in a way that's comfortable for you. We call this putting the feet in standing in Feldenkrais. We'll often just say place the feet in standing. It means the feet flat, the knees bent towards the ceiling and have your knees about pelvis width apart. Have your knees about pelvis width apart. And <clears throat> We're going to do a, a familiar movement that many of you've done. And so you're going to find that you have a very specific way of doing it, which is just to take your knees a little to the right and back to the center. Many times though, to the right and back to the center. Now, when you heard me say a little, what did a little mean to you? Or did you even hear the word a little? Did you immediately start to go quite a ways where we used to go often doing this and taking the knees all the way to the ground. But maybe you could do a small amount. And in that doing the small amount and coming back to the center, just what happens for you across the back of the pelvis? What happens for you in the vertebra of the spine, the low spine? What happens in the mid spine and in the ribs? Okay. And then pause with your knees in the center, please. And then when you're ready, take your knees a few times to the left and come back. If anything causes you discomfort, you can do the movements in your imagination. You do much smaller, much slower. 
And I have, if anybody is confused about how big a movement, I have three people, lovely people here that have done a lot of Feldenkrais. So you'll see that while there's some variation in what they're doing, they're all moving in a very small range. And I invite you to consider that for yourself as well. And I'm also looking through and seeing how some of the rest of you are doing that have left your cameras on so we can, I can check in and see how you're doing. I appreciate that. Now, how about you, so next time you go through the middle and to the right, so you begin to take the knees a little bit right and left. You go through the middle and you feel that almost more than what the knees are doing, what? else is your body doing across the bottom of the feet? And I'm really interested in those ribs. Are those ribs doing anything? And if you want to make the movement just a little bit larger, as long as it's comfortable just to engage a little more of the ribs, you can. It might make it a little clearer, but you don't have to. You want to do what's comfortable. And then now that you're going with your knees to the right and the left, which of course is connected to the rest of your body. So things are happening elsewhere for sure. Can you notice, does anything happen in the head? Does the head stay still in the middle? Does it go in the same direction as the knees? Does it go opposite? Does anything happen in your eyes? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And then let that go. And stay with your knees bent, please, unless you need to take a break. <clears throat> And bring your left hand across your belly to touch the right side of your hip or pelvis, even maybe to grab your pants if you have on pants or clothing there that you can grab. So it's just gonna like at your waistline. Look, just do with the waistline. So you could even grab the waistband. You could even grab the waistband. Now, so you can use your clothing as a handle if you like. Now you're going to take your knees to the left and you're going to also coach that waistline to come along with the knees. So the knees go to the left and you start to coach the waistline to come along. And of course, you've probably noticed that I said this is from the elbow spreader series and we're starting now to create distance between the two elbows. And we're beginning to invite these low ribs to come along in the movement because the longer those low ribs hang behind, the bigger the chance we have of creating a bit of a problem in the sacrum and in the low back. So we want those low ribs to be very aware of the movement. Now, as you add the low ribs to the movements, so you're grabbing your pants, you're just literally you doing this fairly inelegant movement, if you like, of just holding on to your waistband and sort of hauling yourself over a little bit. You're just coaxing along. These Feldenkrais people I have on the screen are making it look really elegant. But for some of you, you've never done anything like this. You can literally just hold your clothes and just coax it to come with you. Beautiful. What happens with your head now? Did that change something about what your head does? And you can try letting your head go with the knees. You can try letting your head go opposite the knees. And you can try letting your head go stay or stay in the middle, stay in the middle. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can play with those three options. That's nice. Good. Now, let's let that go for a moment. Rest your hand. Maybe leave your knees in standing if you are okay with that, your feet in standing. 
we're going to go the opposite direction. So that means you get to use your right hand to reach across yourself now to hold on to your waistband or the top of your very top of your pelvis or the low ribs even better. And then you're going to take your knees now to the right as you also coax those low ribs to come with you to the right. That's it. Beautiful. And you do that a few times going this direction and you feel how your head responds, how your neck responds, how your chest responds. What your eyes, what do your eyes do? Some people will keep their eyes always looking forward. Some people will let the eyes go with. Some people will let the eyes go opposite. You could play a little bit, right? You could play. And we're gonna change this a little bit. So when you're next time your knees are towards the ceiling, pause with your hand where it is, and you're gonna take your left hand and place it on your breastbone, um, either between the nipples or above the nipples if possible. And you think about the middle of the palm being on the breastbone, not the fingertips, the palm of it. And that you just take that palm and you just, you just are aware of enough contact that you feel like there's a bony palm touching a bony breastbone. And now as you take the knees and the pelvis to the right, you're going to carry the breastbone a little bit to the left. You're gonna feel a very small amount of distance occurring, a spreading between your two elbows. And then you're gonna bring them back together. That's right. And when you bring them back together, you can even go just a little bit past the middle. You can go just a little bit past the midline with the knees and with your hand on the chest. So that now the knees and the pelvis are moving opposite. They're moving opposite of each other of the breastbone. They're not moving in the same direction. They're moving opposite. So you carry your left hand to the left, the breastbone to the left as your knees go to the right. Ah, there we go. That's it. That's it. The distance between the elbows begins to spread and then they both come back to the middle and they get closer, the elbows get closer, but always these, the lower half and the upper half are moving in opposition. What does the head do? Does it go with the chest or does it go with the knees? Okay, good, let it go. Let your hands come down to rest. Let your legs go to, into the lengthened position if you like, and just pause and feel and sense. Now, when we have these pauses, those of you who are new to the work may feel the temptation to sit up and comment in the comment box. And it's a wonderful thing we can do with Zoom, but I encourage you to stay with your sensation unless you really have something that you need help with. But it's better really usually in these kinds of lessons to struggle through a little bit and wonder what did they, what did they mean by that? And could I interpret that my own way? And then if you really feel that you can't interpret that your own way, you might be able to take a look at one of the people on the screen that are highlighted and get a hint. But it's not so important that you do it right in this work. It's important that you, you puzzle it through. These are movement puzzles. And puzzles are more fun when you figure them out yourself instead of someone else doing them for you. Please turn to lie on a side that could be comfortable for you to be on for a while. <clears throat> Put whatever padding you need under your head to have your head more in line with your spine. 
You want to have both arms out in front of you at shoulder height. So you won't want to rest on your, on your head, on your head, on your arm. You'll want to have the arms out in front of you. <clears throat> so knee on top of knee and mostly in front of the waist. So you bring the knees up like you were going to make a good chair for someone to sit on with your thighs. And then you put your lower legs underneath your knees. Your heels are more underneath your knees than underneath your bottom. Have your spine nice and long and your head mostly above your pelvis. So some of us have a habit of lying where our head and our shoulders are always way forward of our pelvis. See if you could bring your head and shoulders to be more on top of your pelvis, even though you're in the side lying position. Mm -hmm. Good. And one hand on top of the other, and you're just finding the right amount of padding. Good. Now let's just do a simple movement of sliding your hand a little bit forward on the body, the top hand a little bit forward on the bottom hand, and then a little bit back towards the elbow. So you're just sliding that top hand. So I can't say left and right because everybody can choose their own direction. That top hand, you slide it on the bottom hand and maybe it slides off onto the floor or the bed. And then the hand slides back along towards the wrist and towards the elbow. Now this is gonna be a little different than the traditional thing we do in Feldenkrais. You get to bend the top elbow. So go ahead and as you slide back towards the bottom elbow, the top elbow can bend. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then you slide forward. And you notice when you slide the arm along, is there anything that happens in your nose, your chin, your breastbone, your upper back? And then let's start to slide that top arm more and more towards the bottom, the top hand more and more towards the bottom elbow. So it starts to, the top elbow starts to bend up into the air as the hand comes towards the elbow. And then eventually it could even slide towards your shoulder joint, which means that you'll need to make some room for it somehow, right? You, so you have to let, I think, you have to let your chest open towards the ceiling. Can you feel that? That maybe the chest opens towards the ceiling as the hand comes towards the shoulder joint and your nose starts to face maybe towards the ceiling. And then you slide the hand back forward and it slides along the forearm, the palm, and the nose probably turns a little down. And the breastbone probably turns a little down. Now for now, your pelvis, your knees stay pretty stable. I mean, they might slide a little bit, but they don't need to be a purposeful movers. And then go ahead and slide your hand so far back that it could keep sliding and come onto your breastbone with your elbow facing the ceiling. And then just keep that palm again on that breastbone, kind of marry it a little bit there. Now it's not gonna slide anymore. But go ahead and carry the elbow behind you, spread the distance further between the elbows, which begins to open the chest a little bit more towards the ceiling. And you might feel that the top knee slides a little bit, or it might lift a hair, but it doesn't need to move a lot, maybe. You don't need to go so far that it needs to move a lot. And notice that the distance between the elbows is spreading apart and coming together. And then you can come all the way back and then slide the hand back to the shoulder and out towards the elbow and to the other hand and just take a pause. Now, of course, if you need to change positions, you decided it's the wrong side for you to lie on or this just isn't for you, you're always welcome to do that. You're in charge of making your own powerful lesson. It's an important piece of the work is to claim what's right for you in any given moment. While more or less sort of following the direction of that the lesson is going so that you can still get the benefit of it.
Okay, let's, let's play with that a little bit. Well, let's leave the hands on top of each other and you can bend your elbows if it's more comfortable to have your hands by your face for a moment even. Just do something comfortable with your arms. Now feel your top knee on top of the other leg and just have the image or the sensation or the idea that you wanna slide that top thigh in the direction of the knee a little bit forward and a little bit back. So this is where it be, is helpful if the knees are a little bit more in front of your waist, the more unbent your knees are, the more challenging that might be, and that your heels are more underneath your knees than underneath your bottom. So now it's not like an arm, for sure it's not like an arm. When you slide that top knee a little bit forward and a little bit back, it's a much smaller movement, isn't it? But you can kind of feel how the inside of your thighs or the inside of your pants are sort of rubbing each other, the seams of the pants or the inside of your thighs sort of rub each other a little bit. And it's a small movement that's really generated from the pelvis, isn't it? Yeah, comes from the hip joint, the pelvis. So you tilt the top side of the pelvis a little bit forward that slides the knee forward to the bottom knee and it turns your, your, the flesh of your belly a little bit more towards the floor. Not a lot, but a little. And then if you retract the hip a little bit beyond your neutral, you slide the knee a little bit back, a tiny bit, a tiny bit, I mean, oh, very little, the belly starts to kind of move a little bit towards the ceiling. It's so small though, compared to what you can do with your breastbone, it's really small, unless you start lifting the knee, which is not what we wanna do right now. Okay, good, let's let that go again. Bring your arms back out to shoulder height. Slide that top arm back towards the elbow and towards the chest and let that hand come to your chest, please. And just pause with it there on the chest. And then go ahead and marry it there to your chest and begin to take the elbow into the space behind you, which means it carries the chest with you. And you probably feel that the top knee slides. Okay, so do that a couple of times. You bring the hand, the elbow back and you've let the knees come back. And then you take the top elbow back again in space. Just stay with it on the breastbone now for a while. And you take it back in space again and you probably feel that the pelvis, the knee slides back a little bit too. And what does your head do? What does your head do? What would make it easy? on you, easier on you. Okay, now this next time that your elbow comes back to being facing to ceiling and your head is forward and the knees are just resting on each other, we're gonna change it. And this time, as you carry the elbow and the chest back, slide your knee, your pelvis forward. Slide your knee and pelvis a little bit forward. Ooh, that's a little tougher, yeah. And you just reverse it and you try that two or three times. Mm -hmm. That's nice. And if you've never done it before, there's no reason for it to be easy for you, right? So you try less hard. Reduce the effort, increase your laughter at yourself, or at least a smile, maybe an inner smile might be possible. And then come on back, let your hands slide back out along. <clears throat> and just rest on your side, please, unless you need to go to your back. Just feel your breath. Sort of the inner life of yourself, right? Okay, please bring your arms back on top of each other again. And slide your top hand back 
to your breastbone. And then bring the top hand up to hold your chin. So below the upper lip and above the chin. I mean, below the bottom lip and above the chin. So a thumb will be on one jawbone and the index finger will be on the other jawbone. Let your mouth try to spread your fingers so that it, you kind of have one thumb on one jawbone left and right, not up and down, spread them left and right, mm -hmm. left and right. So you open, let's try it again. Everybody bring their hand out in front of them so they can see their hand and they go, oh, there's a, and spread your fingers and you can feel the, see that there's kind of like a, a U shape between your thumb and your index finger. So you're gonna use that U shape to come below your lower lip, but above the chin and put one thumb towards one ear on one jawbone, lower jawbone, and the index finger on the other jawbone towards the other ear. Then relax your hand, your fingers, and place the hand that's on the ground on your forehead. See if you can find a way to place it on your forehead. Let your mouth be softly, softly open. And begin to spread the distance between the elbows and then bring the elbows a little towards each other. Now, this means that first your hands kind of move just the tissue of your forehead and your jaw, but then they might actually move the bony structures so that you begin to move your skull and your jaw a little bit opposite of each other. Now it's so important that you have no illusions about this being a big movement. For me, I kind of was thinking early, it's like a couple of snails. If I think of my elbows like snails and they are moving away from each other and closer to each other, it helps me to slow it down enough that there's not a threat to the system. Out of this many people, there may be one or two people who find that this will be cause a little bit of dizziness or nausea, and I would like you to stop. I would like you not to do it then. But the rest will probably be fine. Let it go. Let your hand come out in front of you, slide your other hand along the elbow and rest the palms on top of each other. It's a kind of a weird idea for many of us. We don't really realize that the skull is not the jawbone and the jawbone is not the skull. We don't realize it. They're attached, but it's a, it's, it's um, a looser attachment than we went, might think. Most of us work pretty hard, right? Not to walk around and drool. We learn this pretty early in life. We don't want to walk around with our mouth hanging open. We don't want things flying in it. And we don't want things dripping out. Right? So we learn to hold our mouth closed, but maybe unnecessarily so sometimes. Tighter than it needs to be. So bring your arms back out to shoulder height again. And let's slide that top arm back, the top hand back and feel the elbow bending, feel your chest going a little towards the ceiling, bring your hand to the breastbone and then slide the hand up to your forehead. We're gonna change the positions. So you slide your hand up the front of your face to your forehead. And it's like you're kind of going, oh my, oh me. And then you have that hand on the forehead. It's nice and soft there. The mouth is lightly open or the, the, at least the lips are not tight and bend your other elbow and put it on the jaw in a similar kind of way. So we're just changing and reversing the hands. Now you can have your lips touching and that could be interesting for some of you because as you take the skull one direction and you take the jaw the other direction, you'll feel your lips 
brushing. So some of you may like the feeling of the lips brushing, and that tells you something's happening that you otherwise couldn't sense happening. And as you do the movement, could you maybe imagine that this, this skull, these bones, all of this is more like a warm paraffin wax, the tissues, the muscles, and it's, it's being lightly warmed. It's just barely melting, just barely melting. So that it becomes like a very lazy sort of movement. And what do your eyes do? Do your eyes go with the jaw or do they go with the skull? Wonderful. Please let that go. Bring your hands back down. And when you're ready, roll to lie on your back. On your back, you will want to adjust some of that padding. Under your head, so you might not need so much as you need on your side. And wow, there's been some changes, haven't there? Been some changes. What has changed in your contact with the floor from these sideline explorations? Please bring your feet to the standing position. That means feet flat on the ground, knees towards the ceiling. Place one hand on your breastbone and one hand across the waistline to grab the pants on the other side. You get to choose. And as your knees tilt in the direction, in the one direction that is away from the hand that's on the breastbone, the knees tilt that direction away from the breastbone. You carry the elbows away from each other and then you bring them back close to each other. The two elbows spread and the two elbows come together. A few times, let the head follow the direction of the breastbone. So it goes opposite the knees. Uh -huh. And then a few times the head goes with the knees. Mm -hmm. That's nice. So let's let that go for a moment. Bring your knees back, keep them in standing if you are able to comfortably. Let your hands rest. down by your sides. Now bring one hand to your forehead and one hand to your jaw. Same kind of positioning we used when you were on your side, but it might be a little bit easier. And just ever so gently begin to spread the distance between the elbows it's like a centimeter or two, maybe. And at the jaw, of course, it's way less than that. And then you bring the elbows back towards each other. They could even go past the midline a little bit. Uh -huh. That's nice. What are the eyes doing? Do the eyes go with the skull or do they go with the jaw? Can you choose to do something different with the eyes? So if they go with the skull, you take them in the direction of the jaw. If they go with the jaw, you take them in the direction of the skull.
Okay. Bring your hands down. Take a pause. Remember which hand was on the forehead. It's reverse the hands. So different hand on the forehead and a different hand on the chin than you had just a moment ago. And begin to take the skull and the jaw opposite each other. And what is the tongue doing? Now, many of you will say, I have no idea. And that's totally okay. No idea, I don't know, are great answers in Feldenkrais. But do something different with it. So maybe you don't know, but you just start moving it in some way. So let's take it out of the habit. Maybe you do know, and you're like, oh, I could try making it go with the, I could try inviting it, not making it. I could try inviting it to go with the, the skull, I could try inviting it to go with the chin. That's nice. And let it go and rest your hands again. I'm going to put it a little together with the knees as we wrap up. And then I'm just a little bit over. Okay, so you can put whatever hand you want on your forehead, the other one on the jaw. And begin to take the knees left and right, inviting those lower ribs to go with the knees. As you take the knees left and right, that saves your low back tremendously, saves your sacrum. And then start to ask yourself, okay, as my knees go left and right, what can I do to differentiate the, L, the skull and the jaw? So do you want your skull to go with the knees or do you want your jaw to go with the knees. And a, don't make it so large that you have to strain or hurt yourself. And as you feel it getting confusing, it helps to slow it down even more it's to the point that you just think nothing is even really happening here. And you feel the snail's pace of distance spreading a little bit between the elbows and the elbows going a little closer. The snail's pace between the jaw and the skull and the knees don't have to go a long way. And then once you know what you've chosen to go with the knees, could you choose it differently? So maybe you chose the skull to go with the knees. Could you choose to have the jaw go with the knees? That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Let that go. Let your arms come down. Let your legs come down. Yeah. Sense now how things are for you with your body on the ground, your yourself lying on the ground. What has changed in the way that your shoulders right and left are, are lying there in their contact and the weight, the shape. What's changed in your space behind your low back? What's changed in the weight on the back of your pelvis? How do the tissues of your face hang now? Do they know something more about gravity?
And then as you're ready, begin to roll yourself through a side, some way that's really comfortable, not in any hurry, the way that works the best for you. Through a side. No, Jana, absolutely not. You should never continue with pain. Never continue with pain. Yeah. Mm. Choose a path of less pain. We are the less pain, more gain people. We are not more pain, more gain. It's totally the opposite of what many other approaches are. You wanna reduce the stress and the strain. So come up to sitting, and then when you're ready, come up to stand. We're not really done, so don't leave unless you have to. We're gonna, we're gonna have a little check-in here with what we feel, and I'm gonna give you this weird little finale on this before we take comments and questions. Come up to stand. It's important when you come to stand to just feel yourself in standing. And then walk around and be curious. Did anything about these oppositional movements somehow affect the ease of my walking? Did it somehow affect my balance? My, my feeling of myself being in the world. My, my feeling of my ability to meet the challenges of the world. And then come back to sitting however you were sitting at the beginning. And remember that you got a chance to turn to look towards one direction. Let's find out if anything changed in the quality of that turning and in what you see. Is there anything a little easier about it? And then you got to turn in another direction. Okay. <clears throat> and I, I'd asked you to kind of notice the space inside your mouth before. Okay. Yeah. How is the space inside your mouth? How's that now compared to? And then we're going to do one more thing that might even improve it more. So in sitting, we're going to take our hand and put it on our forehead and our other hand and put it on our jaw. And we're going to do this all positional movement, right? And then I, I assume every language has an ABC song and you're going to get to sing the, an ABC song in your own language. But here's the key. You're going to hear me modeling this. You want to let your th tongue be really thick and you don't really want the letters to be distinct. It's going to be much more garbly, sort of like you, your tongue doesn't quite fit in your mouth. So as you do this movement, it's all here and we're starting to model this. We don't want it to be really distinct. We're going to sing our own country's ABCs. Whatever length your song is, you can stop whenever you want. Someone says theirs is way too long. I can believe that's true. And now feel what is the amount of space in your mouth and how do the tissues of your jaw hit? Okay. Thank you so much for um, 
participating with me in this lesson. And there's so many places we can go with it. As I said, it was a, it's actually a series. There's so many places we can go with it, but um, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope everybody found a little something useful in it. And I'm happy to take questions, but I'm gonna ask you something as well. Uh, I'm gonna definitely wanna see some of these beautiful comments for sure. Great, good, and very specific things that it's you're noticing too. I love that, Corinne. Neck pain is gone. Cheryl, mouth is looser. Judy says, I feel like an owl, owl, but I'm still finding my tongue pressing up. Now that was before we sang the song, I think. So let's see if that helped Judy at all. Uh, Deb, definitely more movement and ability to turn. Renee's giving me a big hug from Germany. I'll take it. I can use hugs. Janet, great space inside the mouth. Love it. Lovely ease, delicious, so much yawning from Nora, less tension from Devin in the back of the head and the neck. Zorka, wonderful. I can see colors much more vividly. Hmm. Margaret, relaxed in the jaw and the elbow also a little bit looser. Christine, heavier, grounded, centered, very relaxed. Ruth, jaw so much looser, feet making better contact with the ground, pelvic area feels looser. Listen to these rich, wide range, right, of experiences. Now, uh, what do you think? I'm going to ask you a question now that is, what do you think is the power of these oppositional movements? What do you think is the power of these oppositional movements? Mm. Gosh, I love those just keep coming in, right? Your love, your, your note. Oh my gosh. These are giving me like chills, chills. <laughs> oh, it's fabulous. Yes. Now, of course, I know there's some of you who did not get improvement. You'll feel like you can't speak up and it's, it's true. Not every single lesson gets improvement for each person or they, yeah, not noticing the distance. So dancing wolf. Yeah. The difference. Yeah. It's not going to happen every time. And um, that has to be okay too. It has to be okay too. Doesn't mean in the vast repertoire of lessons that it won't happen to you for you next time. Mm, aware of my body like never before. Pajola. Mm, mm. So I feel like we need to do the other side now when we normally do both sides. Um, we can do either, John, um, but we did work with both sides the whole time. Uh, there's an underneath side and there's a top side, there's a changing over the hand. So even though you may think we didn't work with both sides, we did work with both sides because when you move the top of the pelvis, it moves the pelvis on the other side. When you move the top of the shoulder and arm on top, it moves the one on the other side. Sometimes we leave uh, once, do only one-sided lessons. And there's two major reasons for that. One is time. <laughs> Uh, the second one, however, is a common one in the Feldenkrais approach, which is to leave a little bit of information in the nervous system about differences between two sides. So where there isn't a true symmetrical lesson, the nervous system actually has a little more things to notice in the next hours after. It's like comparing. And this comparing of sensation, this comparing of differences is one of the ways that you go in to create change in the nervous system. You can't change what you can't sense. You have to be able to sense differences. So I hope that uh, helps as well. Okay, so what is the power of these oppositional movements? What is the power of these oppositional movements? Hmm. I'm going to give you a minute to think about that and be curious about it. And if anybody wants to try to answer it uh, live, you can actually raise your hand. Virtual hand. I won't be able to see physical hands. There's too many to track all that. Okay, Cindy, Cindy my friend Cindy, who's done every summit. Gonna send you an ask to unmute, Cindy. For me, 
I loosened a lot up in my face. Okay, so doing the oppositional movements feels like it loosens something, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, I think we could I think we could follow up on that for sure because it's like you know everything sometimes gets held like it's one big unit, right? So just reminding the brain, the nervous system, these things have a little wiggle. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really do a lot with going, move your jaw off or say, oh, you're cool. Or you try to make people do it that way. We did it very passively. So it becomes more like an invitation for change. Uh, it is, yes, so about, so about, uh, was it Daryl? Daryl says, trains muscle ligaments differently, changes cells. It's an invitation. So it's not something that overpowers. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Cindy. Um, Donna. It does indeed feel like an unwinding and an expansion. So then that and the unwinding and expansion creates like a settling in its maybe different place or I, uh, of course, just just a comment, not an exact answer. I'm curious to see what you're going to say. Yeah, I think that it, it is I, I in that subtlety uh, of the exploration with now any attempt to overpower, we calm the nervous system. We educate the nervous system. We come back to something. Did you remember this? Do you remember this is possible? This, this is possible, right? It's just possible. It's possible to move your skull around the jaw. It's possible to move your skull around the eyes. It's possible to, to change up the tongue. Um, there's also something that happens in these movements that's very directly functional to gait. So we'll see if anybody brings that up. Noah, and you can also tell me if I've been saying your name right. Yes, it is Noah. <laughs> um, I think we get locked into patterns, which is really useful to have a habit. But when we get stuck in a habit, then we don't see the other options. And I think when we do the oppositions and the differentiation, it opens up for the possibility of saying, I love you, I love you. I mean, the different nuances in movement that just kind of becomes richer and richer and richer by doing that. Mm. What I mm. see it is. Mm. I love you. I like that. Thank you. Uh, Tanya, Tanya. Uh, let's see. Here's the unmute. Here's the unmute. I didn't do it right. Here you go. So, do um, you hear me? I do. Okay. Um, I have the feeling always when uh, working sideways, more on a horizontal line or spiral or opposite, uh, all of these things. Uh, seem to make my vertic verticality more vertical and more evident. Uh, and the, leng the lengthening, not only lengthening, but the strength and power, uh, the calm power of, of the verticality. Mm. Really, I, I feel that very strongly whenever I work uh, uh, side to side or spiral or opposite. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I, I really felt that when I st stood up and I was really, uh, I weighed a lot more than, than I do, uh, but I, I still wasn't heavy. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You got a lightness of being. Yeah. It's yeah. good. Thank you for that. And Marie? I got you unmuting, and Marie, you'll need to unmute first. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I feel great now. I can move my head side to side with a lot more ease. And I felt good in walking, very grounded and solid and well balanced. And um, But I did have a, a sh sharp chest pain in the middle of things, but it's gone away. 
Mm. I think it had, maybe it was a correction in my sternum. Mm. I don't know. And I wondered if anyone else, if you've heard of anyone else having that experience. It was fairly, it was a little alarming at first. And then I just stopped everything Good. and rested and breathed. <laughs> and then it went to resolved itself because I don't feel any after effects from that but I feel good overall from the the lesson yeah <laughs> so through th definitely throughout these kinds of lessons there can be a moment in which something goes I don't know that movement and I cannot go there and you might get a, a sharp reminder a sharp pain a sharp something mm -hmm. and it usually does go away very quickly especially if you respect it and you go oh okay mm -hmm. I'm going to take a break. I'm not going to keep trying for that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let that, whoops, sorry. I'm going to let that go for the moment. Um, so it's not going to happen the same for anybody in any lesson because we're all so different and we've all got these little quirky areas and things that are going on, but that can happen. Won't happen every time for sure. You've done a lot of lessons where it didn't happen, um, but it can happen. And, and then uh, what you found is that then suddenly after you take a rest and you respect mm -hmm. yourself and the experience mm -hmm. of it, you come back to it. It's not there anymore. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now what you said first, though, I really want to focus on, which is she said she found her walking to be so much easier. Uh, that's not exactly how she said it, but she noticed that. And so these, these particular counter rotation movements are key in walking, key in walking. If you want to take a step forward without lurching, you want to be able to have that verticality that we uh, heard being talked about just to, just two people back. Uh, if you want to feel the ease of a leg to swing forward, these counter rotations need to go on up and down through the system at very key areas. Um, so there is the beauty of doing these oppositional movements that reminds us, I have parts. Oh my gosh, I have parts. This is a part. This is a part. This is a part. This is a part. They're not just some big frozen thing that I've now walk around the world going, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta function. I gotta talk, but I forgot I have parts, right? So there's this op that it, it reminds the nervous system that there's, there's, cells that are parts and ligaments and tendons and they can have different choices they don't have to be always acting as one unit so that's one way these oppositional movements help and the other way is these particular set of oppositional movements are key this particular set is key to gait key to gait uh bettina i'm going to ask you to unmute Hello. So, um, yeah, I felt um, like uh, Tanya mentioned the verticality, but all, already at, um, lying on the floor at the end of the session, um, I compared to my first body scan uh, when we started the session. And so I was less loose for me, it's important to be more tonic and so moving and counter movements helped me to gain in tonicity and power. So my walking was different, uh, very different mm. from what I did last time. And thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Beautiful. Okay, so uh, there was a couple of questions about migraines and headaches. And so I'll say, you know, migraines and headaches are caused by so apparently so many different reasons. They're a little bit like, um, no, I'll just stick with migraines and headaches. So could they, could this be helpful? Yeah. It just really depends on the person and, uh, whether the, the one of the primary drivers of them is muscular tension or a certain way of organizing themselves, uh, against the challenge of the uh, challenges of the world. I think there are a lot of other reasons for migraines. So I would experiment and, and, and feel for yourself and feel for yourself. Okay. The question's coming back up again. Do, can we go do the other side? You can definitely do the other side if you want to for yourself. I would wait an hour or two give yourself a rest with this, at least, at least wait an hour or two or wait for the replay. And when the replay comes, 
choose the other side. Okay. And I, uh, anybody else want to add a, a question or let's let's move into just general questions that people maybe have, especially those of you who are the, new to the work, you're wondering uh, what you're getting yourselves into here. <laughs> what kinds of questions do you have? No? Okay. I just want to make sure I don't uh, shortchange anybody who wants to ask something. Um, so what will be in the summit? Well, first, uh, first of all, you have to sign up for it. So if you haven't signed up for it, do so and uh, tell people about it because we work on it for a year and we want people to be able to come. So please do um, spread the word. And there will be short lessons in the summit. So they will not be a long lesson like this, but there will be short lessons. And there are, uh, after day one, there are four lessons a day and around different themes. And they're meant to be more accessible to people to do within the context of uh, a busy life and a, and a busy summit. And then also many of the speakers have embedded small movement lessons into their talks. Not all, but the majority have, have put some kind of experiential piece in. Um, yeah, so uh, that's what's coming in the, in the summit. Is the vagus nerve involved? Absolutely. If you are, um, if, so if you're respectful of yourself and able to move slowly, gently, automatically the vagus nerve is involved. If you push yourself and you go beyond what is comfortable for you, automatically the vagus nerve is involved. So we want to be sure that the messages we're giving the vagus nerve are the messages that, um, that matter you know, matter for us, uh, that we want to be able to have a resilient vagus nerve that knows how vagal complex, actually vagal complex, maybe that would be a better way of saying it, that knows how to, um, how to uh, calm us down, right? Calm us down. Um, the issue of a couple people's hip feels, sounds like they got worse their hip got worse. And that just means you don't like turning your knees side to side with where you're at right now in your hips, or you don't like lying on your side. So um, I would look for ways to make it easier. I, and I would not know the answer to your situations with your hips. If I didn't, um, if I wasn't really working with you a little bit more, but the key for you is to notice if you put yourself in positions that automatically make it worse, then you want to try to modulate those positions. So that might mean a pillow between your legs. It might mean not going onto your side. Uh, it might mean if you're on your back and you're tilting your knees, it means tilting them in your imagination. These are all possibilities for that. Uh, what is the goal, Andrew said? Uh, what is the goal? What was your goal? Our goal is your goal. So that's something to think about. What is it that you want out of, out of a work, out of an approach like the Feldenkrais method? So it's a deep repatterning of the underlying habits so that you can upgrade, basically upgrade your, your habits and allow yourself to become more available to the things that you want to do, whatever your goal is. A lot of people that are signing up here are probably coming because of some kind of pain or injury, but there are others that uh, might be coming because they want to be able to, you know, play their musical instrument better without stress or strain, or somebody might be looking for anxiety. So this is a kind of work that kind of goes underneath other works. You don't Find, you won't find that a Feldenkrais practice by itself is enough. You'll, you'll find that it forms an alphabet, a new alphabet, or new ways of using your alphabet in an incredibly beautiful way. Uh, but if you want to be stronger, you'll need to still do weight training. If you want to be able to play your musical instrument better, you'll still need to practice, but it will change the way you do weight training and it will change the way you practice um, over time.
but not in a single lesson. It is a process to learn to have curiosity, to learn to uh, uh, sense yourself, be aware, to experiment, to, um, to learn to let go of the goal even a little bit actually, so that the nervous system can do what it needs to do with the lesson, as opposed to maybe what you exactly immediately had in mind. Definitely this lesson was a lesson about relieving some of the tension of the face, the mouth and the jaw, the neck, but it was also a lesson about, um, and of course that helps anxiety usually, but it was also a lesson about the uh, components of walking, the components about walking. Uh, yes, this, this session, there will be a replay available for a short period of time. Maybe I think it's a week we're going to have it up. And um, can we sign up for the summit with a link on the Facebook group? You can sign up for the summit right here. Katrina is going to put it in the comments for you right now. She's going to give you the link to the summit right now. And then you're going to meet so many teachers in the summit. Wait and see who you meet in the, in the summit. So many people you're going to get a really exposure to. And you might want to continue to study with one of them. Yeah. Okay. So we'll email you later today if everything goes well, a replay. And then you'll be able to start watching it. I think it's also streaming to the Facebook group. I'm not positive about that. So you might be able to watch it within that. And thank you so much for joining me. I really enjoyed it. And I have a, oh, I have a surprise for you. Next week, same time, Brian Shercliffe is going to be teaching. Brian Shercliffe is going to be teaching same time next week. So you can go ahead and mark your calendar and be ahead of everybody else. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.